All right, so that's how y2 relates to y1. And if we write the uh, integral of u, so this is going to get really ugly. u is that squared. That big thing up right on top. Yeah, so I'm going to take this mess right here and <laughs> drop it in right there. So it will look like... Look like y2 equals y1 times. So we'll put an integral out front. That's oh, hard to see. So it'd be y1 times the integral of your denominator will be y1 squared, and the numerator is e to the negative integral f1 over f2. All right, so it's an integral of another integral. And actually, e to that negative power, that's the reciprocal. You could write it as y1 integral 1 over y1 squared times the e to the regular integral f1 over f2. So however you want to write it, <coughs> either way will work. So let's go ahead and do an example now. <coughs> so I know that this is variation of parameters because it's in the or reduction of order because it's in the re reduction of order section. So if we look back, is this a linear ODE? No, no. Nope, linear has constant coefficients. So it's not linear, so I can't use the y equals e to the mx. So don't try it. So make sure you know the type ODE you're looking at. You don't want to spend eight minutes trying to figure out is it this, this, or this type. You need to know how to distinguish the types from each other. Uh, looking back at variation of parameters, I don't want to flip back in the notes here, but I'm just looking back and variation of parameters was constant coefficients, but Q of X had infinite derivatives. So this is not variation of parameters, which is 22. So it's not linear homogeneous, not variation of parameters. Uh, everything else that we learned it was for uh, order one ODE. How do you know it's not order one? The second derivative. So all that order one stuff, useless here. So immediately you need to look at the order. That tells, that narrows it down pretty quickly. And then once you know the order, then you can further narrow it down. So we can solve a lot of first degree ODEs. There's very limited second degree ODEs that we can solve right now. So if you have a second or third degree ODE, it's either going to be linear or what we're doing right now, which is reduction of order. So we're doing reduction of order here. That's how I'm classifying it. So I'm looking at the degree or the order ODE and then is it linear is it not because this is a higher order. So not linear there's only one choice reduction of order. Alright reduction of order we have all these notes here. Uh, I'm gonna need a non-trivial solution which I need to write down. So our non-trivial solution will be y1 equals x. Is that just given or should we know how to do It's that? given. All right, let's check real fast just to make double sure if this is a solution. So y1 prime is 1, y1 double prime is 0, and then plug in. That's x squared times 0 plus x plus x1 minus y, which is x, and that does cancel out to zero. So we got a non-trivial solution. So I think everything we need is right at the top of the screen. So our y2 is going to equal y1 integral of u. 
And the first thing we have to do is figure out what in the world is this U? Where does that come from? So I'm going to scroll up till I see. There we go. We can use that version of U right there. What is this big right after the X? It says uh, X is that uh, supposed to be like the absolute value or something? Or is the X one minus X? It's X times one. Oh. Okay. It's just a one. Kind of <laughs> I just plugged in that one. That's Okay. The one right there. All right. Uh, I figured out what's F1 and what's F2. Now our original form, I'll rewrite it here, but I'll go up to the top for a second. This is our F1, F2, and F0 right there. It's our coefficients. Before they were A2, A1, A0, and they were constants. So let's write down F1 and uh, F2 and F1. So it's F2 Y double prime plus F1Y plus F0Y equals zero. So what is our F2? X squared. X squared. What is F1? X. X. And what is F0? Negative one. Negative one. All right. So any <coughs> questions on just determining F2, 1, and 0. All right, all we're going to do is F1 over F2, and then integrate that. So F1 over F2, that's x over x squared dx. Integral 1 over x dx equals ln x. All right, so that was pretty painless. So 1 over y1, we said was x. So this is 1 over x squared e to the negative ln x. So it's x negative 2. e to the negative ln x is e to the ln. How do I deal with that negative sign? So it would be x to the negative 1. That's a negative power. And e to the ln cancels. We got x negative 2, x negative 1. And that's 1 over x cubed. So that's our function u right there. Now you might be wondering, well, that's really ugly. That started out really ugly, worked out really nice. Yes, these functions are picked very carefully so that you don't get a horrible mess at the end. So if you just write some random, if I just chose like, sine cosine tangent right there for my coefficient functions it probably wouldn't work out so nicely so you want to be very careful it's not easy to make a ODE problem that turns out to have a nice solution so when you're studying use your textbook or use another textbook for problems you don't want to just write one down uh, the author Tannenbaum do they use like a machine that can come up with like a computer that can come up with Probably the easiest way to create ODE problems is write down your solution, okay. take some derivatives, and see what type of an identity you can form off of it. Gotcha. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. We'll make an easy ODE with like sign. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so that's U. Any questions on getting U? It's not complicated, but it is a lot of bookkeeping. You have to know all the different pieces and how they fit together. So we're ready to write down uh, y2 is y1 integral u, and y1 is x integral x to the negative 3 dx. So it's x to the negative 2 over negative 2. I think we want to keep our constant here. We have a second degree ODE, so we're going to need two constants unless we got an initial condition. So we should expect to see two constants. So that is negative one half 
or negative 1 over 2x. Oops, and it was parentheses like that, so it's plus cx. All right, so that's y2. So we got y1 and y2. Seems reasonable. I'm just. I need two constants. So normally it looks like C1Y1 plus C2Y2. So if we go that route, I won't need this extra CX right here. We got C1, our Y1 was X plus C2, 1 over 2X. All right, I can reduce this down a little bit, this constant. It should be a negative here. <coughs> we can rewrite it as C1X plus C2, 1 over X. I just let my constant absorb the negative 1 half right there. Well, I think that that disappeared with the antiderivative up there. So our I add a one to the power, divide by negative two, and then reduced. So we get that thing on the right. So that one over negative one over two x is y two. I had a plus c up here before, yeah. so if I if I let that plus c survive, here it turns into a cx. Uh, so if I let that survive, what we get right here is negative one over two x plus cx. I think I will get yeah. So I'll have c one x plus c two cx. Basically, that's the same term yeah. right there. Okay. So I think you don't need to have your plus constant hanging around. Is it only for this case because we already had a C1x term? So here, the, here's the reason. You will, so I'll just write over here, y2 equals y1 integral u. Uh, if you go with the uh, plus constant, so y2 will be y1, what's it? I'm going to write a capital U for the antiderivative. It looks a lot like a little u, but I'll go with plus c. And if you just look at the way this distributes, there's my basically first constant times y1 right there. So that's why I'm kind of, you can bring in constants at different times and get an equivalent answer. So you could keep your constant of integration and then that basically accounts for that time, for that first constant times your y1. And that's why I make a big deal about, oh, I'm expecting to see two constants at the end. So like, where should they show up? So we have an option. You can either bring your constant in early, or you could bring your constant in at the end, like we did there. So I need to make an executive decision. I'll say bring your constant in late. So we will not do a plus C right there. And that means your algebra will be a little bit shorter, basically, if you do it this way. So we get C1. That goes away. And then we'll do that simplification that I had. So we get C2, 1 over x. All right, so that will be the version we'll go with. All right, let's check to see if we're right. This is easy to take derivatives. 
So let's go ahead and take some derivatives. We need just a second first and second derivative, and then plug back in. This should be a fast one to check. So y prime is c1 minus c2x to the negative 2. y double prime will be positive c2, positive 2c2x to the negative 3. So I'll rewrite the original ODE, x squared y double prime plus x y prime minus y equals zero, and plug all these in. So we get x squared 2c2 x negative three plus x times c1 minus c2 x negative two minus y, which is c1x plus c2x negative one, hopefully equals zero, 2c2x negative one plus c1x minus c2x negative one minus c1x minus c2x negative one so I have two c2x negative ones and minus c2x negative one minus c2x negative one. So those three terms cancel out and we got c1x minus c1x. All right, there we go, no problem. So that worked out. Some are easy to check, some take a whole lot more time. So this one didn't have any product rule going on. Last questions before we jump into differential operators. So we're going to look at differential operators. We'll first start with mathematical induction because we're about to use induction to prove some things. So we'll start with the math induction and then get into operators. So this has a very fancy name, algebraic properties, properties of polynomial operators. So don't worry about what that means. We'll define most of those terms. So we're first gonna start with mathematical induction. So this is done with a two-step process. So first we're going to define base case and prove that it's true. And second, assume it's true for n and show it's true for n plus one. So we'll suppose, so we'll take some statement a n. So define the base case, prove it's true. So this is usually going to be a one or a zero, sometimes you need to do both. Um, so we're gonna suppose a n is true. Show a n plus one is true. So that is the steps of mathematical induction. <coughs> it's really not that much going on. So we're going to prove that this summation is equal to n squared. So what k value would our base case use? Or sorry, what n value would our base case use? What's the smallest n value that makes sense? One. And uh, zero doesn't make sense because 
what in the world would the sum from k equals 1 to 0 look like? That's not really defined. So there is no a0. It doesn't make sense. So a0 is not our base case, and this is a1. So a1, summation k equals 1 to 1. Remember, 1 is the n value. Alright, so I want to add up terms from k equals 1 and then stop when k equals 1. So there's exactly one term in this sum. Yes. So it's 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. So easy to sum to compute. What is, uh, so now we have n squared, which is our n is 1, 1 squared, which is 1. Alright, so a1 is true. The sum of one terms of this term added to itself is 1. You generally don't need to prove a second base case, but I'm going to do it just for fun. So this is unnecessary. I'm just kind of double checking here. All right, so I want you to check A2. It should involve adding two terms together, and then hopefully it will equal 2 squared. First two terms are 1 and 3. And of course, n squared is 2 squared, which is 4. So the sum equals n squared. All right, so we passed a2. You could write a little true up here somewhere, true. All right, we're going to do our inductive step now. This is all just base case. Now we're going to go inductive step. So if you read back, it says you assume a n is true and show a n plus 1 is true. So I'll just write down a n. So it's a sum. k equals 1 to n, 2 k minus 1 equals n squared. And this is true. So n plus 1. I'm just replacing n by n plus 1. What am I assuming if I write this out? Have I checked that they're actually equal? <coughs> no, I'm assuming what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to show that these are equal right here. So I don't know if they're equal yet. So what I'll do is put a question mark right there. We're supposed to prove an identity. <coughs> what side is more complicated? Left side. So we're going to put the right side away and not touch it for a minute just like we did identity proofs in pre-calculus class. So I want to try to turn the left side into that n plus 1 squared. All right, how in the world can I do that? What is different between what I am starting with and what I am putting a box around in blue? They're really similar. What's the only difference? So it's, the, so it's the original sum, but we have an extra term that we're adding in. So it's one more term than the sum that I put a box around. So what I need to do is separate that out. 
let's write it as I'll go summation k equals 1 to n 2k minus 1 plus what's the very last term that I left out Yep, so just take out k and put an n plus 1. So it's the sum of the previous terms plus that next term. So any questions on what I did right there? I just pulled one term out of the sum so that my summation looks like what's above. All right, now all I'm going to do is replace what is in the blue box with n squared. That's what it says at the top of the board is true. And let's do a little reduction on the algebra. I got 2n plus 2 minus 1. So it's 2n plus 1. All right. Now in pre-calculus class, I told you you can cheat when you're doing identities if you're not sure where you're going. We're not sure how to get to your destination, but you know the destination. So I know the destination. Why is that the same as n squared plus 2n plus 1? Because it's n squared. And then it's n plus 1. Why are these two equal? It's super easy. Just factor. Or not factor. It, distribute. Depending on which way you go, you either distribute, FOIL, or factor. But maybe I didn't see that a minute ago. But it's pretty obvious right now with the two lines written right above each other. So sometimes you just write down what you think yours is going to be next, and then your brain, oh, no, of course, I just factor it out. It's super easy. All right, so that's how mathematical induction works right there. So this will be true for any n, one or bigger, any integer, one or larger. Uh, we're not really going to use this particular summation overall, but that's a good demonstration of induction. <coughs> so now we're ready to talk about operators. So if we start with the definition. Operator turns one function into another. You could consider an operator as a function where it eats its domain is functions and its range is also functions. So it's a little bit strange. It doesn't eat numbers or vectors or other things that we're used to plugging into functions. It eats a function and outputs a function. Operator itself is a function. And its domain is some functions and range is some other functions. Generally, our operators are going to have their domains being differentiable functions, but in general, uh, you can have more abstract operators that can have functions that have sharp turns. For example, you can integrate, you can anti-differentiate, like absolute value pretty easily, even though you can't take a derivative. So the anti-derivative operator accepts a larger uh, subset of functions than the derivative operator, for example. So we're going to let capital D denote uh, the derivative with respect to the independent variable.
So usually d is going to be d dx. Occasionally we have some time derivatives, so we might be having a ddt sometimes. So usually it's going to mean d dx. And the way you're going to see it written is exactly where you would see ddx written. It would be to the left of what it's going to operate on. So this dfx means d is going to operate on f of x. And of course, that's the same thing as ddx fx. We use prime notation. There's lots of ways to write this out. Now, once you take a derivative, since df, also known as f prime, is also a function, you can let the operator d act a second time. So you can do d of df, also known as d squared f, or f double prime. So this is all review stuff, just a slightly different notation. <coughs> when we write exponential derivative notation, we always use a parenthesis to mean take the derivative. But when we use the operator notation, no parentheses on this too. Because <coughs> when I write d squared, I mean take, apply d and then apply d a second time. So you're applying d twice in a row. Just like if you saw f2 of x, what that really means is, or what it should mean is, take f of x and then take f of x again. That's what f squared x really means. Apply f twice. Well, unless you're in trigonometry class, in which case it means f of x times f of x, but that's a different story. What it should mean is what I just wrote down. Did we take trigonometry? Yeah, it's pre-calculus too, is what we call it. Uh, it's got a little sequence and series and vectors thrown in. Well, at some point you took pre-calculus too. I can't remember far enough back yeah. exactly what classes you took. Yeah, but I definitely taught pre-calculus too. Mm. <laughs> All right, what would D0 mean? How many derivatives would I take here? Zero. Zero. So d0 of f is just f. So take no derivatives. Where would you even write that? So more ink, more ink, So d0 is the identity. Well, if you don't have a way to write the identity, you're just going to visually or verbally describe it. Well, you'll see where we're going, why this will make sense. All right. So d0 means take no derivatives as the identity. All right, so that takes care of the word operator. And now, what about polynomial operator? So we're going to look at that word next. So you know what polynomials are, hopefully. What we're going to have is a polynomial in d, not in x. So we know polynomials in x. We're just going to have a polynomial in D now. So our polynomial's name is P. The input is D. Polynomial is going to be A N D N plus A N minus one D N minus one plus a1d. You don't need to write d to the first unless you want to. And you don't have to write d to the zero right here if you don't want to. 
you can save some ink. So I'll write, write them in in blue, the optional. That's the D0 and D1. If you, I recommend don't write down what I put in blue, though. <coughs> So how in the world will this act as an operator? So first of all, what should this operator be operating on? A function. So we'll put f next to it. This whole thing is one unit that's operating on what's to the right. So that's operating on F right here. Let's write out the expanded form. So there's only one way that makes sense for this to act. Basically, we're going to distribute F across all these operators. So this is a n d n of f plus a n minus one d n minus one f plus etc plus a one d f plus a zero f. So I basically distributed f all the way across, and it's important the operator is not commutative. Oh, yeah. I can, let's see. Technically, the grouping would be like this right now. But we can regroup and write it as a n times the nth derivative of f alright so that's how polynomial operators act you're basically distributing like this Probably time for an example, I think. There is two operators here. The second one's kind of boring. So what I'm going to do is exactly what I did above, which is take our function f and distribute it to both operators. So that's the way I distribute it above. So we got d of 2x cubed plus e to the x minus 2 times 2x cubed plus e to the x. So these derivatives, the calculus of this is super easy. 2x cubed derivative is 6x squared. E to the x derivative is e to the x. I'm not performing a derivative on the second. It's just constant times that. So it gives us negative 4x cubed minus 2e to the x. And I can combine my e to the x's. So let's write negative 4x cubed plus 6x squared minus e to the x. All right, any questions on that one right there? All right, let's do one that's a little more complicated. Alright, so now there's three operators. So we're going to distribute our function to all three. So I want you to compute this right now. And also simplify at the end as well. Oops. 
do not write down what I'm about to write down. Just do this problem right now. not doing what you're doing. So check with your neighbor if you're stuck. And expand it out and simplify it. get the same thing that I got on the last line. Well, you should have gotten all of it. And it could be an algebra mistake, could be a calculus mistake. Is that how you do that in the bottom? I did not do it the way that you did it. You were supposed to apply that quadratic operator. So the way I computed was completely different than the way you should have computed this last one. I'll write out the, in the way that I asked you to compute it was the second derivative of 2x cubed plus ex minus regular derivative 2x cubed minus ex minus 2, 2x cubed. That's how you should have computed it. I just realized what I did. It's so bad. So since we on the last like problem, we computed like the U max two operator the same thing. Then you have to just D square of operator minus our last one. Because you have an extra negative sign in there. Yes. So we're about to decompose so Yes, you can do both of those. So what I just showed right here is that I didn't show it for all functions, but it is true for all functions. This operator I'm writing down is the same as the product of those two operators. Not just true for this example, it's true overall. What this means is you can now perform algebra on polynomial operators. You can factor them and then apply one operator, then the other operator, and factors into three or four operators, and the other, then the other. So it lets us take higher order polynomial operators and use algebra to factor them and then apply them basically one at a time. <coughs> yes, sir. So when we have the, the d squared, that just means the double derivative. Yeah. Let me go somewhere up here. So we didn't have d cubed, but that would be the triple. Okay. I didn't. And I didn't write d zero, as you noted. That was a waste of ink. Usually, it will show up as a constant. I mean, if if it's really plus d zero, what that really means is plus one. It's the coefficient in front of that operator that you write. So there's technically a d0 right next to this minus 2, but we don't need to write it. All 
All right, so I just showed that, well, I didn't really prove, but we saw an example where you can factor the polynomial and apply one operator at a time. Algebraically, is it true that d minus two times d plus one is the same as d plus one times d minus two? It's also true in calculus. So what that means is operators are commutative. At least these operators are commutative. Are there some that are not? Uh, sure but not ones that we're going to use. Well, so I'm just going to write operators are commutative. And what I mean is our operator that we just defined is commutative, this polynomial operator. All right, sounds like it's time to go. 